Wednesday. And so be sure to be here that Sunday morning. But we're going to continue our School of the Spirit series. I want you to go to John chapter 14 if you have your Bible. And if you pay attention when I preach, which might be about 30% of you, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't be offended. It's a choice. Offense is a choice. <laughs> You'll recognize that the scriptures I'm about to read are the same scriptures that we read last week. But how many of you know the word is living and active? And one week you can pull from it one thing, and the next week you can pull something totally different. So that's what we're going to do. And I might just preach from them again next week. John chapter 14, verse 16. I believe they've got it on the screen as well. This is what the Bible said. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth. Somebody say the Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now go to John chapter 16, verse 13. It's on my Bible, it's the next page. And it says this, however, when he, the spirit of truth, say the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word. Make it real to us today and give us the boldness to live it out. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. Before you're seated, look at somebody and tell you he's the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of truth and you could be seated today. Now I recognize there's been a lot of <clears throat> special things happening today. Graduation, baptism, uh, incredible salvations that just happened. Uh, praying people out who are leaving uh, and going to do ministry and uh, I recognize today that there may be some guests here for graduation, uh, and I recognize that when we talk about the, when we say school of the spirit, we're expecting uh, prophecy, gifts of the spirit, uh, laying on of hands, which we have done throughout this entire series. I believe we've seen eight people baptized in the Holy Spirit in the last three weeks. Uh, somebody give God praise for his goodness. And... But today, uh, this week, as I was praying, as I was just seeking God, I, I had this burden that I could not pinpoint. Uh, anybody ever had a burden that, it, that you can't pinpoint, but then you pray about it and God reveals to you? And so I began to pray about it, and I began to recognize the burden of the Lord was that there is a war going on, both in the heavenlies, but also in every social institution of our day. Now, when I talk about warfare, some of you perk up because you, you enjoy intercessory warfare and you think of one thing. I, but today, a little bit more practical, a uh, little bit more uh, in your face, not about how loud you scream in tongues, sweat and pray, but more so how you live your life. And the war that's going on in the heavenlies and in our social institutions is the war for truth. I said the war for truth. Y'all, this is a talk back church, so don't leave me hanging. There is a war that is happening in our society over truth. And I said earlier, I'm glad I get to preach this on graduation Sunday because many of our graduates, our high school graduates, are getting ready to go into secular sociological institutions where the truth is being bent, torn, changed, and just altogether thrown out the window for the sake of cultural acceptance and appeasement. Now, we've talked about the Holy Spirit, the baptizer. We've talked about the Holy Spirit and why we need him. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. First and foremost, the truth. Jesus said, first off, that there would be a last day's dearth of truth. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when we will see these things be. Jesus had just finished telling them that all of the monuments and buildings that they see, not one stone will be left on another. 
And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, you got to watch in the Bible and listen to the first thing that Jesus says. Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So Jesus said, in the last days, deception will be so rampant. In fact, in Matthew, right there in 24, in that chapter, Jesus mentions deception in the context of the last days four times. Saying that if he did not shorten the days, even the elect would be deceived. And so we begin to recognize, I begin to lay scripture on top of our, on top of our culture and on top of our time. And I now recognize that we are living in the days Jesus prophesied. Days of deception. This word deceive, it means uh, to stray from the truth, to wander about, or to move without purpose. The hallmark of the last day would be deception. In Matthew 24, 11, following the scripture we just read, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Verse 22 of Matthew 24, I just told you that unless the days were shortened, even the elect would be deceived. Paul would write in his letter to Timothy in the fourth chapter, the first letter to Timothy in the fourth chapter, and he would say, now the Spirit speaks expressly. When the Spirit speaks expressly, you better listen. That in latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving and seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The word deceiving spirits, it means to deceive, to lead astray. The word heed means to bring a ship to land, to touch at it or to give thought or effort to it. He uses the word seducing spirits. That means wandering, imposter, corrupter, uh, spirits which are used of demons or evil spirits. Are you getting the picture? So Paul is saying there are men, there's a time coming when men will give thought, they will give their life to, and they will welcome like a ship to shore in their own life, seducing spirits. Vagabond, imposter spirits. Oh, it's quiet in this Pentecostal church today. And I like it that way sometimes. There would come a time. The Bible said of Satan in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14. That Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That there would be a time that people will open their doors, open their home, open their life to spirits that are demonic in nature. Through entertainment. Okay. Through social media. If we're not careful in our universities. We will open our life to seducing spirits. And one of the things that we have gotten wrong in the church is that we entertain demons instead of casting them out. We open up doors in our homes through what we watch and through what we allow our kids to watch. Okay. 
And then we wonder why our home is in turmoil. We wonder why our thought process and our sleep patterns are in turmoil. Because we have welcomed like a ship to shore, seducing and demonic spirits. And one of the words there that Paul uses, it means to touch at. And so instead of taking authority over them and shutting the door the devil has come through, we touch at them. We pet them. And we say, oh, we, in fact, when we should be casting them out, we make a bed for them. Hmm. And we call it our entertainment room. It enters and it grabs us. And it keeps us grabbed. And I, I'm, I'm not legalistic. I'm not saying you can't watch movies. You can't listen. To, what I'm saying is, is that whatever you watch, whatever you listen to, David said, I will put no unclean thing before my eye. So whatever you're watching, whatever you're listening to, it must be unto the glory of God. And you better make sure. Paul said, and neither give space to the devil. That word space means territory. Don't even give him a door to walk through. But we are so deceived into thinking that if we preach holiness, and listen, I've already wrestled this week about how this message is going to come across. And people are going to say, well, you're legalistic and you're just rules, rules, rules. No, 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 no. My righteousness is filthy rags. My works can do nothing to save me. But why would I go back to what he saved me out of? Why would I? Listen. He translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So why would I sit down on my couch and open up the portal called the TV? Listen, I'm not against television. I got one in my home. Listen to me. I've got, you've got to understand the balance. I've got one in my home. I watch TV, but I watch nothing that is going to open a door for the enemy to come into my house and take Torah territory in my children and take territory in my marriage. I'm in deep waters. Come with me. Because we just watch whatever we want to and then we expect to walk into darkness And to stand out and take over when darkness says, oh, I know you. I know you. I've set up shop in your bedroom. I've set up shop in your living room. Uh, Y'all with me today? Do you understand? I'm not saying don't watch anything ever. You understand I'm saying that? Don't misquote me. What I'm saying is what you put before your eyes has the power to either free you or bind you. And Jesus said, Lord have mercy. Jesus said in the last days many would be deceived. Paul said they would be so deceived they would just welcome any old spirit to shore in their life. Uh, and, and there was one. Th- this took a turn last night as I was finishing my studies and putting everything together. This took a turn because I was going to talk to you about some different doctrines and how they were demonic. And there was one that the Lord just really said, this is the only one you need to talk about. And it's something that's happening in our day with our young people and even people older in the faith, faith and it's called deconstruction. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, okay. It's a doctrine of demons. Whew, got quiet. Let me, let me help you understand something. The devil is not as black and white as we want to make him out to be. He is one of mixture. Now, we've been talking a lot about abortion in this church because we believe in life. And so let me talk about it one more time just because I want you to, to, to have truth. The devil and his little imps did not sit down at a council table and say, how are we going to deceive the nations? How are we going to get them to murder children? How are we going to kill entire generations of people? They did not say, let's go on the news and say we're murdering babies. One of them may have said that, and I could see the devil saying, that's too too obvious. 
And they went around the table and finally one of them, may, and I'm just you know, imagining, one of them may have said, what if we called it women's rights? So that any time a man of God or a woman of God gets up to denounce abortion as murder and the spirit of Molech who they would lay their babies in the hands of this God whose hands were burning and they would play the drums so loud to drown out the cries of their babies. Can I tell you something? Entertainment has been the drum for abortion. Because we have been locked up and in, in distracted by all these other things Yet every year, entire generations are slaughtered for convenience. And I stand up here and say abortion is wrong and we stand for life. And there are some people that say, well, what, you don't believe in women's rights? Oh, I absolutely believe that women were created in the image of God and they should have rights. But I do not believe they should have the right to murder the baby in their womb. So, so listen, do you see... How the devil likes to mix things. And so in this thing called deconstruction. Deconstruction was derived from a French philosopher named Jacques Dorinda. I'm going to sum it up real quick. Deconstruction asserts that human language at best communicates, not the absolute truth, but how a certain individual perceives and conceives truth, listen, at a certain moment in time in the context of cultural, political, religious, environmental, and experiential influences. This asserts that there simply cannot be one absolute truth as it pertains to God. And a significant number of people who have deconstructed their faith have left the faith altogether because deconstruction is a doctrine of demons that was derived from a human philosopher to get in better touch with yourself. Oh, y'all don't want to talk about it today. And here's the mixture. You talk to somebody who's deconstructing their faith and they'll say to you, well, shouldn't we all be going and finding out if we really believe what we should believe? Yes, but if in your journey to make sure you believe what you believe, you end up further from him than where you started. You have not deconstructed anything except for your spiritual life, and now you are deceived and on your way to hell. Okay, and you should absolutely get in the word. What do I believe? Why do I believe it? What does the Bible say about it? But to deconstruct without the Holy Ghost is deception. Because the Holy Spirit will never lead you further from Jesus. He will always take you closer to Jesus. And of all the people that I have watched in my life go through deconstruction, I have prayed with some of these people. I have wept with some of these people. I have fasted with them for the salvation of their friends and family, only for them to deconstruct. And then I hear that they're out drinking and partying with the same family that they were trying to get saved. They've either started to approve or partake in a lifestyle that the Bible completely and holistically can dims that is not deconstruction that is deception and backsliding in the mixture well shouldn't we always be finding out what we believe yes but to do it apart from the holy spirit is going to lead you into deception y'all with me still okay deception so so let's talk about and you know what? I'm not done with this point yet. Let's talk about it because the people who deconstruct will say, I'm just so free in Christ. You're not free in Christ. You're free in your flesh. 
I just love everybody more. Your definition of love is to accept the lifestyle that they want you to accept because they don't like the truth that the Holy Spirit brings in conviction. I love everybody, but I can't accept every lifestyle. Every, every person, every person on earth was created in the image of God. Every one of them. And they ought to be honored like that. But not every lifestyle is created in God's image. And there's mixture. Oh, so you don't approve of me living my life this way. You must not love me. Let me teach you something about love. True love confronts. True love will not watch a son or daughter burn and not say anything. So we say, Pastor, why do you get up here and talk about this all the time? Because we've got a whole generation of sons and daughters who are deceived and nobody is telling them. They are deceived. And they've deconstructed. I just love everybody better. I'm just so free in Christ. I can do whatever I want. That is not freedom. That is bondage to the things of this world. Ugh. I'll have to talk about what I feel on another date. I, because I can't just talk to you about deception without giving you the answer to deception, which is truth. Everybody say truth. So back to our theme verse. Truth is, a, there's a last day's dearth of truth. Secondly, there's a last day's need for truth. The Bible called him the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. When you read that scripture, it kind of makes sense why the world has gone mad. Because the world cannot receive truth. They can't receive truth. And there are people that you try to talk to and tell the truth to, and they get angry. And, and, and you know what? I've purposed in my heart from this pulpit when I preach. I don't mean to offend your natural body. I mean to offend your spirit. Whatever is residing in there that needs to come out and needs to be addressed and needs to be covered in the word of God and found out through the word, I'm here to offend that. So when you speak the truth to people and they rise up and start getting angry and that thing starts to manifest, y'all don't like when I use that word, that thing starts to manifest, you have the authority by the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit to cast demons out. He said, the spirit of the truth, the spirit of truth, the world cannot receive. But then he, he adds this, which I love so much. But you know him. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Does anybody know the Holy Ghost? The world can't receive him, but you know him. For he will be with you and he shall dwell in you. And, and, and in John 16, the Bible said he will guide you into all truth. Everybody say all truth. The word guide here means to guide in learning, to explain, or to instruct. There are three things very quickly in which and how the Holy Spirit guides us. We're going to get kind of practical here for a minute. Is that all right? Okay. Number one, he will guide you into truth through his word. I'm going to say that again. He will guide you into truth through his word. Look at somebody next to you and say his word. I did that because I need a drink. <laughs> he will guide you into truth through his word. Can I help you understand something? There is one absolute truth. One. Oh, I thought I came to a Bible believing church today. I said there is one absolute truth. It is his word. Not my truth. Not your truth. I can't tell you how much that just irks my soul when I hear people say that. Especially Christians. I'm just living my truth. You're going to live your truth straight to hell. It's not, it's not funny. Listen, I said it. It's not funny. Because they're living in their truth, but their truth is deception. And they say that to basically say, don't tell me how to live. I'm going to live how I want to live. It's a, it's a doctrine of demons. There's one absolute truth. His word is absolute truth. 2 Timothy chapter 3. There's a very interesting passage of scripture, verse 12. 
Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Thank you, Holy Ghost. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, Paul is writing to his son, the Lord Timothy. And he's talking about them. And then he turns to address Timothy. But as for you... Continue in what you've learned, having firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood, do you hear me? From childhood, you have been acquainted with the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So Paul says... Evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. The word imposter here means one who swindles or cheats. An imposter is somebody who blends in until another person points out there's an imposter in the room. Jesus referred to these people as wolves in sheep's clothing uh come on now paul said in acts 20 he's leaving the church of ephesus and he says to them for i know that when i leave you there are going to be ravaging wolves that come in among you that try to change the doctrine by which i have taught you so 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 imposters can look like me And I live my life in a way that I ask the Holy Spirit, what I preach, let me live. And what I live, let me preach. And let it be the Bible and not my opinions and not my man-made ideas. I want to preach the scriptures. But there are pastors. There are preachers. There are people who have influence, who are imposters. And they are leading people into a doctrine that is a doctrine of demons that is going to send them to hell. And Paul said, you've got to watch out for them. Just because somebody's got pastor in front of their name, don't make them the real deal. Imposters, Bible study teachers, influencers, my God. You know, I, I begin to think about this because in, in the apostles' days, their false doctrine happened through letters. Can I give you a history lesson? They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have TikTok. They didn't have Instagram. And so the way that false doctrines would be passed through the churches is that evil men would take letters and they would write them and then they would sign them, Apostle Paul. They would sign them, Apostle Peter. And they would take them to the churches and they would read them aloud for the people to hear. So that's why they created councils of godly men to read the letters and determine that was real, that was fake, that's a false doctrine, this is real scripture. Do you, welcome to history class. And so how we came, this is how we came to the canon of the scriptures. But today, in five minutes, an influencer can get on TikTok or Instagram. And they can spew so much false doctrine and use the Bible without context, without interpretation without definition and millions of people have viewed a teaching that is not found in the Bible they are imposters y'all with me they're imposters and they get on there and they spew I'm amazed I follow some, some people who are not imposters, but they have great influence, men of God, and it's insane. They could post a video and in two minutes have hundreds of thousands of likes, hundreds of comments. False doctrine can spread like wildfire. 
And if you're not in your word, if you're not, not just reading your word, studying your word, you ought to read the Bible with a dictionary and a thesaurus real close to you. Oh, there's free resources. Blueletterbible.org can help you read the Greek and Hebrew. Find out what they're really saying. You've got to study the Bible because there are people who will take one passage of Scripture and create entire movements out of them and have no cultural context to the Scriptures. I'm passionate about this if you can't tell. His word is truth. John 17, 17, Jesus says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. John 8, 31, Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you, what? If you abide in my word. If you're not reading his word, you're not a disciple. I know that's harsh. That's what the word says. If you abide, live in my word, eat my word, breathe my word, then you are my disciples. And then he follows that up with... You will know the what? Truth. And the truth will make you free. What truth? The absolute truth. And I'm, I'm just to the point that I am tired of Christians who have no backbone. Christians who bend and bow to pressure. Who bend and bow to cultural appeasement and approval. Since when was it cool to have culture approve of the church? Jesus said, you will be hated of all men for my name's sake. If you blend in, however in the world will you stand out And the only way you're going to stand out in this culture is to stand for truth. But you can't stand for truth if you're not in the truth. Not only will he guide you through the word to truth, but he will help you handle the word. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself as as to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth one of the ways we err in our society is we do not know how to properly interpret scripture there are two words used for interpretation the first is exegesis the second is eisegesis exegesis I'm coming to the word to be told what the word says that's a simple definition I said, Jesus, I'm coming to the word to tell the word what it says. I don't go to the scriptures with a made up mind. I go to the scriptures to have my mind made up. And you've got people who take one passage of scripture, they rip it out of context, they twist it, they contort it, they preach it. It sounds real good. And because we're emotional, we call emotion anointing. But it's actually a doctrine that if you apply it to your life, will have no power because it's really not the word of God. I know this is tough. Eat it. It's good for you. Then we have the rhema and the logos. If you call yourself a prophetic person, but you're not reading your Bible, you, that you're not a prophetic person. You're a pathetic person. Because any prophet that is not anchored in the word is a prophet leading people to deception. There's the, rape, there's the logos, the written word. Written for our benefit, for our learning, that through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, we might obtain hope. And then there is the rhema, the right now, the fresh bread from heaven, download from the Holy Spirit that comes to you in the middle of the night when you don't know what the answer is, but he speaks to you. And he says, this is what I'm saying when you're ministering in the altar in the marketplace. And he speaks to you and says, I need you to go over there and I need you to pray for that person. That's the rhema. But the rhema and the logos will never contradict one another. Because the Spirit of God will not stand in opposition to God the Father. Uh, people say, well, the, well, this is my interpretation. The Spirit gave me this interpretation. And you can't take that interpretation and throw it through Scripture and come out on the other side with the same interpretation. 
For precept must be upon precept. Line, Isaiah 28, 9. Line upon line. What does he mean? If you're creating a doctrine or a theology out of the scripture, it needs to coincide with the rest of the scriptures. Hmm. And you have to take into understanding the Bible was not written to America. It was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. I told you uh, on Mother's Day when I talked to you for just a minute about women in ministry and women being called of God, that people take Paul's uh, uh, instruction to Timothy and where women ought to be silent in the church and they use that and they abuse that and they create a doctrine out of that but that does not flow in line with everything else Paul said I'll help you again if you weren't here on Mother's Day in their culture women sat on one side men sat on the other there were reports getting back to Paul that as the preacher the teacher was teaching the women from this side were yelling at their husbands on this side as loud as they could asking questions about what the teacher just said and Paul said while the ministers ministering be quiet and when you get home then ask your husband he was not saying they cannot preach in church or they cannot minister or be used of God passionate about that too but if you read it with the eyes of America you come out with an interpretation that doesn't make sense in the rest of scripture are you am I making sense I know we just went to class it is the school of the spirit hello welcome and we're, because I feel like this is so needed if I could I feel like it's so needed that I feel like I could tell to tell you that in the last 10 months that I've been pastor this is probably one of the most important messages I've preached to you in the context of where we are societally and culturally. So, so we have to rightly handle truth. Uh, and the Bible is a prophetic book. So there is a space for prophetic interpretation. But prophetic interpretation never, ever, ever exceeds the theology and doctrine of the scripture. Y'all with me still? Not only will he help guide you through the word, he'll help you handle the word, he'll help you remember the word. John 14 said, when the helper comes whom the Father will send, he'll teach you all things and he'll bring to remembrance all of the things that I have told you. This is why you need to memorize scriptures. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, I have hidden your word in my heart. Now, if we were quoting it the American way, then I might quote scriptures and impress everybody. The psalm, the writer said in, in, in the Hebrew language that I might not sin against you. I've hidden my word, in, I've hidden your word in my heart, not so that I don't, that I can speak in tongues and impress people. I've hidden your word in my heart so that when nobody else is watching and I want to go look at that computer screen, your word pops back up in my mind. And I turn and say, I'm not going to sin against you. When I want to smack the taste out of somebody's mouth and you grab me and your word gets back up in my mind that I might not sin against you. When I want to tell off that person who cut me off, you grab it that I might not sin against you. Not so I can quote scripture and be impressive, but so that I can keep my heart pure. How will a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Next, he'll guide you through prayer. I've got to hurry. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself, thank you, Holy Ghost, the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That's a powerful scripture. I love it. I love it. you got to keep reading the Bible. Because it keeps on going like this. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What is the will of God? It's truth. So even in his praying for us, he is praying truth over us. When we join him in prayer, we are praying truth. You say, how do you pray truth? The easiest way to pray truth is crack your Bible open and go to your prayer calls and start praying the scriptures. That's the easiest way to pray truth. But if, you, if you've ever been in a moment where you're so deep in prayer... 
And there are things that are weighing on that you can't utter, you don't have words for, but the Spirit takes over. I've heard it sweep across this room so many times. You just start groaning. You just start letting out sounds that you're like, I don't know where that came from. The Spirit is praying through you. He's praying for you. And the Spirit will never pray in opposition to the will of God. Okay. All right. So now next... He will guide you through discernment. Everybody say discernment. The answer to deception is discernment. Psalm 1966, teach me good judgment and knowledge for I believe in your commandments. This word judgment means to taste. To use the taste buds to distinguish and enjoy flavor. Discretion or discernment. Discernment is not just about telling what is good and evil. Discernment is determining what is good and what is God. I'm going to say that again. It's not just what's evil versus good. Discernment will help you determine what's good and what's God. Because not everything that's good is God. Not everything. Choices I've had in my life could have gone at one point as a teenager and made money playing music on cruises. Some talent person approached me after a talent competition and wanted to take me out and go do. And I thank God for people in my life who love me enough to tell me the truth. I doubt he even remembers this. He's standing back here in this corner. I was telling Matt Hines about it one day. I was, I was so excited. I was like, man, I'm going to go on cruise ships. I'm going to eat as much as I want. I'm going to play music. And Matt just straight up said, he said, that's not for you. He said, that, that's not for you. You got to be careful. And I'm so grateful I listened because that was a good thing, but it wasn't a God thing. Could have had a lot of cool experiences, could have made some good money, but it wasn't God. Discernment helps you to taste. As in, now, I want, I want all the husbands to be careful, and if your husband cooks, wives, you be careful too. Anybody in the room ever had food without seasoning? Just throw your hand up. How terrible is that experience? <laughs> terrible. Absolutely horrendous. Good judgment will help you discern what is tasteful and what is not. I promise you, I have enough sense. You can go ahead, come on, I'm gonna try to land the plane. I have enough sense to know if you put a McDonald's hamburger in front of me and a filet mignon, I'm going to choose the filet 10 times out of 10. Unless it's midnight and I can't get the filet at McDonald's, is the only thing open. But because my taste buds tell me, <laughs> and later on, my body will tell me in the effect of weight gained, mental torment, my body will let me know you should have gone with the filet. So is the spirit that as I'm discerning, Whatever choice I make later on, I'm going to feel the effects of the choice that I made. And discernment helps you recognize where is God in this? Because if the devil is a God of mixture, God is a God of truth. And the Holy Spirit will get into the devil's mixture, and you know what he'll do? He'll pick up the truth out of mixture. And he'll hold it up for you to see, and he'll say, in all the chaos, this is the truth. Y'all still with me? Okay, I got one last thing. Because you've got tasting, it, you've got to taste, but then you've got testing. First John says that we ought to he said in chapter 4, verse 1, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see where they be of God. Now, critical people love that passage of Scripture because they'll sit back in their pew, and before they get engaged, test the spirit. The word test means to examine, and there's this really bad theology that says I've got to dabble in it to understand it I've literally heard of people who will do Ouija boards 
just to understand and they have no idea they've just opened up a door from hell into their house no idea well I gotta dabble it in order to understand it you don't the Holy Ghost don't need to dabble in nothing he has the mind of God and God knows all things whether you like it or not there there have been things listen because God don't always do things I like is there anybody in the room that could testify there have been a lot of things that I liked I enjoy doing God said no helping me to discern what is good and what is God test the spirits but then, then there's the because that's a critical examination that is applying it to the scriptures and making sure is this in the Bible is this truly God but then Paul comes in, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and he says do not despise prophecy test all things hold fast to what is good abstain from every form of evil so Paul is saying test everything but don't despise everything most critical people that I've ever met pretty much hate anything that moves and breathes and they'll find the negative in anything Paul was saying there's got to be a balance test all things but don't despise all things what's he saying you know there may have been a time that somebody prophesied to you or prayed for you and it was totally flesh I'll never forget one time uh, it was a it was a joke so it wasn't in a real service so let that be the context of this conversation but you know us churchy folks we just walk around and lay hands on stuff you know my son, my son will be screaming. I'll just lay my, I'll just grab him by his face in the back of his head and just, thank you. And he thinks it's hilarious. I'm like, no, I need your attitude to change. So I'm really laying hands on you. But there was, a, there was a lady that came and she did one of our Christmas banquets. And one of, our, one of the guys walked up to her and laid his hands on her. And she said, all I feel is cold hands. And I said, I said, I'm so stealing that. I'm so still on that. I say that to say this. That just because it might have been in the flesh one time does not mean people who flow in it authentically are in the flesh. There's people that hate prophecy because people have prophesied and things haven't come to pass. Not everybody who prophesies is wrong. Well, somebody prayed for me to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and I didn't get it the first time neither did I there are so many people in this room neither did they don't make a doctrine out of one experience his word says that he wants to give you the Holy Spirit so I test it what am I feeling oh I'm feeling like God doesn't want to give me the Holy Spirit what does his word say he gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey if we being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more will the Father in heaven give us the Holy Ghost? Your feelings are a liar in terms of leading you. You're allowed to feel. You're allowed to feel those emotions, but you cannot be led by them because then you've lost your discernment. The last thing I'm going to say is this. If you want to be somebody who stands for truth in an age of deception, you've got to be humble because arrogance has no destiny because it believes it's already arrived and God will never be able to help you discern because you'll always think you know everything stand on your feet I want to say one more thing but I want you to stand so you help me stop talking As it comes to discernment, I read something yesterday that just leapt off the screen at me. It was a Facebook post by a great, one of my best friends, leapt off the screen at me. And he said this, you need to heal from trauma so you don't call your triggers discernment. There are people who have rejection trauma so that when a leader says no, they think they have discernment that that leader missed God. But in all reality, 
that leader was saving them. But their triggers told them, don't let your triggers talk you into something that isn't God. You've got to heal. Be humble and be healed. I want you to lift your hands. I'm going to pray over you. He is the spirit of truth. Truth is his calling. Truth is his goal. Find the truth. Lift up the truth. Exalt the truth. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus over the potter's house that you raise up people of truth. That we will not be people who are easily deceived. Tossed about by winds of doctrines. But we would be people of your word. People of prayer. Who in turn become people of discernment. And can walk out your calling and your destiny for us in truth. Lord, I pray for those in this room today that need to be healed of trauma. I pray right now that you would begin to let healing come over their heart and begin the process. So that their triggers don't talk them into something that's not you. And Father, I pray that you would raise us up to be people who love the truth. Not just truth in a corporate sense, but individually, when we are approached, when we are confronted with truth, let us love truth. To you be the blessing, the honor, and the dominion, and the praise. And everybody who loves Jesus, shout amen. Put your hands together. Give Jesus praise today.